Good afternoon. My name is Eddie Jones. I'm the Director of Endoscopy at the Rocky Mountain Regional VA as well as an Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Colorado. I'd like to thank SAGES and the Flexendo Committee for the opportunity to present today. I'll be talking about feeding tubes from PEGs to GJs and to percutaneous Js and answering some questions telling you how I like to do it as well as the common indications, risk, and comments. I have no disclosures. Indications for a PEG, as we all know, it's the inability to take anything by mouth. That could be nutrition, that could be hydration, and it could be medications. Uh, in addition, we can be placing PEGs for decompression, malignant uh, bowel obstructions. Patients especially who are going home to hospice, they can benefit from the placement of a uh, G-tube, so they get the nasogastric tube out of their nose and can vent themselves at home. In addition, there are patients who uh, have gastric volvules who are poor surgical candidates uh, can undergo PEG placement, and that can help them get through the acute event uh, and maybe their definitive treatment. And finally, we can place them for access for therapy. I think the easiest example of this is patients who have undergone a roux y gastric bypass. And in order to reach the biliary tree, Oftentimes, a special scope may be needed. A standard ERCP scope won't be long enough. Uh, however, if we were to make uh, or place a gastrostomy in the remnant stomach, a standard scope can be used with the normal angles, uh, and it can be very, very effective in allowing them to clear that biliary tree. Pre-procedure, we need to be assessing these patients to determine uh, if the indication that you were called for is appropriate. A lot of times these are patients who've had a stroke, who have been in the ICU for a long period of time, uh, or they have ALS disease. But I do want to make a, a special mention of dementia. Once a patient has severe dementia such that they are unable to take PO, their uh, morbidity and mortality related to the dementia in and of itself is exceedingly high. And in one study, there's about a 54% 30-day mortality in patients who had PEG placement for advanced dementia alone. And that jumps to about 90% over about six months. And so I'm not saying don't put a PEG tube in a demented patient, but if that is their only indication, I think we need to be having a long conversation with the family to see if this is really gonna benefit them or it's gonna turn into a risk for further complications down the road. We should also be assessing their surgical history, making sure that their anatomy is as expected. Uh, it'd be a suboptimal thing to place a scope down to do a PEG in a patient and then to encounter uh, Roux and Y gastric bypass or some other altered anatomy. And then we need to be assessing for comorbidities such as ascites. While that is not a strict contraindication, we'll get into that in just a second, it is something that we need to be thinking about and prepared for. We need to also consider their abdominal wall thickness. Obesity makes it more difficult to be placing these tubes. Uh, however, it is not impossible. Sometimes you need to alter your approach, maybe even consider using a laparoscope to help you uh, get this procedure done if it's truly indicated. We should be obtaining informed consent and then giving them antibiotics. I'll review the data in just a little bit about the indications for antibiotics. So contraindications. Absolute contraindication is only if you can't get the scope through the esophagus. If you can't reach it, you're not able to place it. In addition, I would consider a pretty strong contraindication if the patient's not going to live more than four to six weeks. In those patients, there's no significant benefit to allowing them to get feeds in through their stomach, and you're exposing them to the risk of the tube of itself, in and of itself. Relative contraindications, as I mentioned, ascites. Uh, while patients who have uh, severe cirrhosis and ascites and are decompensating, they'll do very, very poorly. Uh, I would not consider uh, putting a tube in them except for rare circumstances. However, a patient who's stable and who's overall doing well but can't eat for one reason or another, uh, ascites isn't a strict con contraindication. Coagulopathy is definitely something we need to consider, but I've placed tubes in patients with an INR of 2.2 successfully and without complication. How you do it needs to be a little bit more cautious, but it is definitely possible. And in all of these other significant comorbidities. Uh, these tubes have been successfully placed, but I think we need to be considering preoperative imaging in some of them uh, and planning ahead. It's not as simple as a straightforward PEG when you're asked to place a G-tube in someone with, who's undergoing peritoneal dialysis. You'll need to plan to stop the dialysis, get the, the peritoneum evacuated, 
drain it out, place your tube, wait four to six weeks, and then fire it back up, and it can be very successful. But we need to be, as I mentioned, in these situations. So let's review how I do it, and this is just a few slides here. Hopefully it's how you were doing it as well. We want our patients semi-recumbent. We want their head up a little bit. We need to protect the airway, and that doesn't mean you have to place an endotracheal tube, but it does mean you need to be thinking about it. Aspiration is our highest risk of mortality related to our procedure, and so we need to be very, very aware of it. I would uh, typically place a gentle restraint on the arms. Uh, that can be uh, your standard restraints in the ICU, or it can just be your nurse, tech, helping hold the arms down for the procedure. It shouldn't take all that long. And then you need to be giving antibiotics as far as selecting a site. I typically pick a site about two centimeters or two finger breaths below the costal margin. Uh, oftentimes, this is somewhere close to the mid-axillary line on the left. It can be closer to midline. Sometimes in patients, I've, it's almost stretched over to the right side. But I really think the key point is, is getting below that costal margin. Patients who have tubes in place for a long period of time and the tube travels right underneath that rib, they're miserable with it. And so we need to be ensuring there's some. You want to maximally insufflate that stomach after you get the scope down, and you're looking for transillumination. So when you press down on the spot that you like to place, you can see the glow of the light on the inside. The newer uh, Olympus 190 scopes, I find I don't have to push the transillumination button, but <coughs> excuse me, you're more than welcome to use it. In addition, you're also looking for one-to-one -one motion, and that's the idea that as uh, you press in on the abdominal wall, uh, the endoscopic view documents uh, intrusion of the stomach into the lumen. It is important to consider uh, that uh, people can be tricked. Uh, I've worked with a number of residents over the years who have a great view of the heart beating away at the top of the stomach, and they think that that's the one-to-one -one motion. So we just need to be cautious about making sure we're looking at the right portion of the stomach and we truly do have one-to-one view. -one some things, uh, some tips that help with this, you need to maximally insufflate that stomach and elevate that head of the bed, as I mentioned. That helps get that stomach to expand below that costal margin. And in some patients, you may need to review pre-op imaging. In an obese patient or someone with known hepatobagoly, it may be helpful to see, is there a window that you can identify? And if there's no window at all and they've had prior surgery, then we may need to consider an open or a laparoscopic assisted tube placement. Here's a nice poster presentation uh, where reportedly the procedure went smoothly with the safe track technique, as I have mentioned. And unfortunately, the patient bled, decompensated, and it x -lapped. The tube traveled nicely through the left lobe of the liver. So what is the safe track technique? As I've already mentioned, it's translumination, it's one-to-one -one motion, and then what I call the Ponsky technique. And this is the idea that you take your small needle, usually the needle I use to inject the lidocaine, and I place it under uh, negative pressure. I aspirate as I am placing it into the abdominal wall, and I should only get air back in the syringe once the endoscopist or endoscopic image shows the needle tip. If they can't see the needle tip and there's air coming back into my syringe, then I'm probably in the colon or some other luminal structure. If you do all of these, your risk of having an injury uh, is Other tips or tricks, the skin incision should really be the size of the tube only. I've had residents make a two centimeter gash for something that's less than a centimeter in size. And that just promotes leakage. you got to sneak under there and put a stitch in the skin to help close it up. And sometimes they'll use an 11 blade and they'll go all the way into the stomach. So then it bleeds, and these things all make it more challenging. So I take care to emphasize, especially to trainees, in the beginning, please just make an incision through the, incision through the skin and sub-Q and dermis. Uh, do not get into the stomach and make it only the size of your tube. As you're placing your finer needle, pay attention to the angle. Sometimes this can be straight down. Sometimes it can be almost pointing up to the patient's left shoulder. Uh, every patient's a little different. And as they withdraw it, they should be intending, or we should be intending, to place the angiocath at the exact same angle. I find that a smooth and forceful insertion is very helpful. If we go in slowly, what tends to happen is it seems to slide on the serosa and create a tunnel in the stomach wall. Whereas if a smooth, forceful motion in the same direction as you had the finer needle is placed, it tends to go right into the stomach wall without issue. Securing the tube, you have to have laxity. One centimeter 
at least is recommended. Some authors recommend two centimeters. So typically what I'll do is I'll pull up on the tube before I remove the scope, make sure it rotates freely on the inside, and I'll see what the tube is with gentle tension on the skin. And if it says four, then I'll add two centimeters. Because the only number I am going to report is the depth is the upper edge of the bumper. So if I see four, plus one centimeter for laxity, plus one centimeter for the size of the bumper, gives me six. And I only report this specific number, that's six centimeters, because that's the easiest thing for patients and residents and nurses to see. They don't have to take down dressings and pull the tube up and look underneath at the skin. They can just look at the tube as it emerges from the top of the bumper and know that it's at the same height. We're also starving these patients. There's good data out there to show that we don't need to be waiting 24 or 48 hours. You can give them meds immediately, followed by clamping. And you can feed them uh, at, at least 50% of a feed, if not full feeds, in two to three hours. Delays of four, six, 24 hours or more. There's no change in complications and no change in tolerance. So uh, this is a paradigm that I'm still pushing to change at my local institution as we had classically been waiting at least 24 hours. Now we'll jump into complications. There are a number of complications out there, both minor and major, from infection and leakage to accidentally removing the uh, tube and having to go straight to the op. Aspiration. This is our uh, most common, most severe complication. It happens in up to 15% of patients. And it is our number one chance for mortality related to the tube itself. If you look at uh, the reasons patients die, it's number two after malignancy, i.e. the reason that they need the tube in the first place. In patients who are high aspiration risk, you can consider placement of an endotracheal tube, but keep in mind that this is not fail-safe. Also, once the G-tube is in place, there is no guarantee that aspiration can't happen again. And in fact, in high-risk patients, I would, contend, I would consider feeding the small bowel itself, either through a GJ extension or a percutaneous or laparoscopic jejunostomy tube. I think it's important to remember that out of all of these tubes, there is no true guarantee against aspiration. And in patients who are high risk, we really need to make sure that they're getting feeds in an upright position and that the feeds are continuous low volume in contrast to high volume boluses. The next risk to talk about is a risk of infection, which ranges in studies from 5 up to 65%. And I think this wide range is probably a result of a number of factors, but a lot of it, I believe, is reporting. As you can see in the images on your right, there are two out of four that are infections. The one closer to the center on the right is a little abscess. The one on the upper right is actually a granulation tissue, which was reported as an infection. And the one on the lower right is a candidal infection. And then the other is an example of a dressing that was placed over a supposedly infected site. Usually these occur at the level of the skin, staph aureus or beta hemolytic strep. They are significantly decreased when you give a single dose of cefazolin. That is the current GOAT standard, and it is the recommendations of a number of the large GI societies. It can reduce a risk from 29 down to 7% in some of the randomized controlled trials. There is some opportunity out there for possible improvement. This was a study. I reported it down there, Blumenstein et al. Uh, glycerin hydrogel dressing was placed once a week for three weeks, and it theoretically reduced the risk of infection for 47 to 15% uh, compared to a standard gauze dressing. I think more data is needed before we start altering our dressings and spending a lot more money. Um, however, these results in that randomized control trial are definitely encouraging. Leakage. Up to two-thirds of patients will have leakage uh, sometime after their placement. This can be due to a number of factors from hypergranulation tissue pushing things up to a buried bumper creating a larger hole. But in general, it's really due to excessive movement or a tangential exit from the skin. And as you can see in the image in the upper right, I've drawn a right angle. And as the tube exits from the abdominal wall, it really needs to exit at a 90 degree angle. This will allow the creation of a nice circular defect. However, patients in general don't like to have this tube poking straight out of their belly. It makes their shirt and clothes look funny. And so what they'll do is they'll tape it sideways, as you can see on the bottom picture. 
when you tape it sideways, you tend to create a more elliptical incision, and this turns into a larger hole that then leaks. And unfortunately, when they present, a lot of people will end up tightening the bumper or upsizing the tube. Now the hole looks larger, let's put in a bigger tube. And that will temporarily stop the leaking until you develop a bur buried bumper syndrome or until they tape it again and you get an even larger hole. So I would strongly caution against this. The management of leakage is ensuring that 90 degree exit from the abdominal wall. It's making sure they have appropriate nutrition to heal it, managing hypergranulation tissue. And honestly, it's a lot of time and patience and managing expectations. When these patients